And then when I work on true maximal strength, maybe I want to start working on rate of force development, I'm going to do a push press. And then once I can do a push press, then I'm going to be doing a, uh, a push jerk. So then I'm going to do here, and then I'll actually go into a split. So then everything begets one another, but I can't just go and do splits all day long. I mean, I don't, it's, that will wear my athletes out. And so that's where I said, maybe I'm going to do clean pull and knee, work on lifting weights off the ground that I can't even complete, and then I do the full movement, and then I can do full clean pulls heavier than what I actually turn over in a full clean. You know, so it, it, it all works together. <clears throat> now this is that tempo, the chicken soup. When you have time, what I would do is I would just think about these intensities. You're going from what I call extensive intensive to intensive extensive and then to extensive. So you're wanting to build a work capacity early on. Some coaches maybe call it intestinal fortitude whatever you want to call it, but it's still sub-maximal, it's still aerobically based. So 70 to 80 percent of their current PR, so I don't think that Usain Bolt's going to be doing his general prep training, he's not going to be doing his tempo efforts based off his all-time best PR. He's not run that since when. So I'm probably not going to, I'm going to take it off as 2012 for maybe what he's capable of as a coach now. You know, so again, you take these times and you base their work efforts off their current feelings. So that means slowing it down instead of what you think is their best. And maybe sometimes their best is better than what they've performed in competition. So maybe you go by that as well. But the idea here is when you start adding in more sport specific training, more rate of force development work, more speed, that your low days are purely restorative, recovery. We do something called midsection tempo. So that's where we actually, on a grass field of 100 meters, we jog, and I would say it's about 18 second pace. Now I'm working with, you know, my, my primary sport right now, which is kind of like my bread and butter. My foundation sport is bobsled. So it's, you know, it kind of fits my background, track and strength. So my job is to go in there and make sure that we continue to dominate the top. So my guys are not exactly 100 meter sprinters. They're about 10.5, 10.7 ability. They're pretty fast. So if they can run a 10.5 in 100, they're running 17 seconds on the grass on their easy days. But what we do is they'll actually do a midsection movement. So maybe a seated plate twist or maybe a sit up med ball throw. Then they get up and jog for 17 to 18 seconds to the other side of the field. They'll do alternate V-ups. Maybe they'll do back extensions. We'll do anywhere between 1,200 meters to 1,600 meters a session. The run is actually a recovery from the midsection movements they do. That's how slow it is. So don't think that they're actually out there like, you know, we're not training for a 5K. It's actually just perfusion of blood through the system. That's all I'm wanting. So it's, it's nothing else. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that athletes who have an aerobic base, not a, again, power speed athletes don't need to be able to run a marathon, but power speed athletes with some type of aerobic ability are faster to produce ATP, resynthesized phosphocreatine, and actually have lower uh, rates of perceived exertion in high intensity sessions. That's very important to know. Plus, how many of our athletes run rounds? At the international competition level, it's not like you go to one meet, you run one heat, or you have one competition, and then you go home. It's like day one, day two, day three, day four. You don't think you need a work capacity to go through two to three weeks of condition of, of competition. I mean, look at the Olympic Games. I mean, it's you're over there for a training camp for two weeks, and then you've got competition, and that's rounds. You're over there for like a month. You know, it's like Work capacity, you need it at all levels. This is the whole thing put together. So strength endurance follows with, as far as if this is all done at one time across the board, strength endurance in the weight room works well with acceleration on an incline. Works well with concentric base jumping or throwing, which works well with extensive aerobic development. 
So again, you can just work your way through and see how the different training factors that we typically think of as separate actually meld together. Now, this is just evidence from three of my athletes. Uh, like I said, at the training center, I'm blessed that they have believed in my athlete monitoring program and given me some, some technology that allows me to track my athletes down to the millisecond, down to a specific angle, down to the exact moment of action. Like I know everything about my athletes more so than they know. And, and it's very important because it allows me to build a very good training program for them. Uh, the one thing I do with that data, where I think a lot of sports scientists get it wrong, is that most sports scientists in the past have ruined their name by keeping the data and trying to publish it. I give the data back to the athletes immediately. There is no lag time. My data, as soon as I get it, as soon as we test, the data is there for the athletes immediately. And then we go over it immediately. It's in their hands immediately. Sport coaches get it immediately. My goal, help me sell it, is to get the entire USOC doing this. Because I can guarantee you instant results. We don't need to be hoarding this. I mean, this is some good stuff. And so, uh, what we did is, is, like I said, every four weeks we test every resident athlete at the training center. We test their jumping ability, which gives us power output, flight time. We test overall strength, rate of force, impulse, ground contact time in sprinting, flight time in sprinting, aerobic abilities, psychological abilities. I have an entire profile of my athletes every four weeks. I know exactly when they're going to perform well, and I would argue that's why we set history in Boston World Championships back in February. This is on one of my bobsled athletes. Actually, all the data that you're going to see here is from one athlete. This is average flight time. So this is actually, like I said to Jeff's class this morning, sometimes this is crazy because this is too perfect. Like, it's not always like this. Uh, sometimes it's very close. Sometimes you'll actually see a, they'll actually improve in one area and decay in another. But what I have them do is, we test these athletes, again, on force plates. They jump from a weight on their back of nothing, a PVC pipe, and then we go up to a 10 kilos on the bar, 20 kilos, 40 kilos, and for the men, we go up to 60 kilos. So we first start off with static strength. We hit them here, make sure their femur is parallel, three, two, one, jump. Without a counter move, they have to be here, jump in the ground, we get flight time, instantaneous, data on everything. If they load, if they drop, everything. So this is tracking her data from May till June, or May to January, right before we have world. So again, she improved in every marker. Counter move with jump, that's where she got to select the data, or select the jump height, same amount of weight on the bar. But we say, when you're ready, you jump. And she gets to jump, she decides.